Hi, I'm Jonathan Callahan from IFO Science. I'm here today with Administrator Charlie Bolden at the Spacecom Expo in Houston, Texas. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Administrator Bolden, what is your role as an administrator of NASA? What does it mean to be head of NASA? Uh, in very common terms, I'm the CEO. I'm the chief executive officer of the agency. And because NASA is a, a scientific research and development agency, I have four major business lines, if you want to put it that way. We have human space flight in the Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate that takes care of the International Space Station, commercial crew and cargo, uh, heavy lift launch vehicles, exploration to Mars and the like. We have a science mission directorate which has uh, four subdivisions, earth science, planetary science, uh, astrophysics, and then heliophysics, which is the study of our sun. Uh, then aeronautics, which is NASA's heritage. We actually began uh, 100 years ago this year, as a matter of fact, as um, an organization called the NACA that was looking at, at aeronautics and nothing else. And so NASA came from them when, uh, when President Eisenhower established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And then finally, the, the smallest and the newest of the business lines is what's called Space, space Technology Mission Directorate. So, and then we do education and a lot of other things. So my job is to formulate the strategic uh, guidance, the thrust for that organization to go to the, to the president, go to the executive branch uh, and uh, propose funding for the organization, propose programs, then move on to the Congress to, to propose that they support the president's budget request uh, to make it happen. And I oversee ten, actually nine NASA centers around the country um, and then uh, representatives in three, eight, three uh, embassies around the world in Tokyo, Paris and um, in uh, Moscow. So you've also been an astronaut uh, from four missions yes. uh, and you're now the head of NASA. Which would you say have you found the more difficult, which has been more of the challenge? If I were to compare being an astronaut and being the NASA administrator, which is the more difficult of the two? Um, being the NASA administrator, you know, the, the good thing about being an astronaut is you're focused on uh, preparing for your flight and then the conduct of the mission. Um, as the NASA administrator, I have the entire NASA portfolio, which is four mission directorates that we talked about earlier, um, uh, 18,000 people instead of just my crew of seven or whatever it was. Um, and back during the shuttle era, I didn't have just one spacecraft for which I was responsible. I had the whole shuttle fleet. So it, it's more difficult being, uh, being the NASA administrator. The big focus of your administration is going to Mars. Why do you think it's so important that we get humans to Mars? Uh, biggest reason, what, oh, you, you, when people ask why do we want to get humans to Mars, probably the biggest reason is the fact that Mars is um, part of this big mass of things that came about in, in, during the days of the Big Bang, if you will. And so as m more we learn about Mars, the more we actually understand about our own planet Earth. Uh, getting humans to Mars gives us the ability and the knowledge that we can comfortably move to another place in the solar system should should Earth become uninhabitable someday. And uh, also, while it, it won't save us when the sun finally collapses, uh, the journey to Mars will be the precursor for interplanetary and, and way down the road intergalactic travel. So it, it's sort of the first step to, to convincing humans that they can, in fact, become multi-planet species. Sort of it's a, it's a, um, a carry-on from what we started in, back in the days of Apollo when we moved out to the moon. What age of person today do you think will be the people that set foot on Mars? Ooh, what age of people will be the first on Mars? And my guess is it will be the students that are in elementary school today and, and, and younger. Uh, the high schoolers will definitely be flying commercial spacecraft. Uh, they'll be going to cislunar space to work uh, around the moon uh, as we develop, continue to develop the technologies and, and refine our ability to keep humans uh, alive and healthy. Uh, as we go on to Mars, but realistically, the ones that are going to be right in the prime to go to Mars are the kids that are in elementary school today, and that's why we spend a lot of time, uh, we, we have a program that goes K through 12, and we spend a lot of that time with elementary school kids. If you had to put money on a firm date that we're going to land there, yeah. what would you pick? What would I pick as the firm date to land humans on Mars? I don't know. The, the date that I do know is we will be in the Martian environment in the 2030s, so that means that in the 2030s, uh, as early in that decade as possible, uh, NASA will have either made a commitment to, we will have made a commitment to, to one of three things. Either um, operating in Martian orbit for a while and doing telerobotic operations control from that orbit, 
uh, operating from a moon of Mars, Phobos, Deimos, and doing telerobotic operations on the surface in preparation for humans coming. Or if the technology has advanced much quicker than it looks like right now, and we understand the human body a lot better than we do right now, uh, the third alternative would be to go directly to the surface of Mars, and that would happen in the 2030s. So in the 2030s, I'm very comfortable forecasting that humanity will be operating, living and working in the Martian environment. The, the date, the exact date for boots on Mars, that's anybody's guess right now. To, to a lot of people, going to Mars might just seem a bit fanciful at the moment, yeah. considering we're still in Earth orbit, we haven't been back to yeah. the moon since 1972. Yeah. Do you think now what we're developing with a, a new rocket, the SLS yeah, coming yeah. in, with Orion coming in, yeah. are we now almost at the point of no return where we really have the stuff? Oh, there? do I think we're at the point of no return? Not quite, um, but we're at, a, we're at a very perilous point, and I think I've said this before. Um, from an exploration standpoint, uh, the nation has made a commitment, and, and you know, as, as much of a commitment as, as any nation can make, we've made a commitment to putting humans on Mars. The president, without a doubt, um, the Congress, without a doubt. So this present leadership in the United States has committed to put human, humans on Mars. To stop now um, and turn around and go back and say, okay, let's think about another place we want to go. Let's, let's think about uh, focusing on lunar exploration and, and just taking a hiatus there. Uh, I think it would be disastrous personally. That, that's my personal opinion. Uh, no data, no anything, but it's just that to stop the thrust of getting humans to Mars uh, and taking away, as a matter of fact, uh, the dependence and the opportunity for commercial entities uh, and entrepreneurs to be the ones that go back to the surface of the moon and provide the infrastructure there to do things like exploration, like resource mining, um, putting telescopes in place, doing a lot of things that have potential for commercial development. To take that away from them by having the government uh, you know, NASA go back and, and make it a, a, a NASA venture to, the Mar to Mars. Um, we're dependent on international partners to get to Mars, and that's, in, that's an incredible place to be, uh, to make it a, an international journey as opposed to a national journey. We could get back to the moon, you know, as a single nation. That's, that's not very helpful, to be quite honest. The International Space Station has existed for 15 years now, and it has been successful because of its very international nature. The fact that in spite of everything going on down here on Earth, um, you have nations that sometimes don't talk to each other. Our, our relationship with Russia right now is tenuous. Our relationship with Roscosmos is, is beautiful. Um, the way we cooperate with them, the way we, we train with them in Houston, in Moscow, in Star City, we launch out of Baikonur. Um, that's the way you, that's the model that you want for the future of humanity. And so um, to, to step back and say, okay, the U.S. is going to focus on a, a U.S. mission to the moon, I think would be a step backward, to be quite honest. Do you think the mission to Mars will be an international mission with countries like Russia and China? Um, I think when humans go to Mars, it will include every nation in the world that has the wherewithal, the interest, and the, and the resources to contribute. And, and I mean all nations. In some way, uh, every spacefaring nation of the world will probably participate in the eventual uh, human journey to the surface of Mars. Uh, we have the United Arab Emirates, for example. No, nobody, other than, than uh, people who play soccer, football, uh, everybody knows about UAE because they're supposed to be hosting the World Cup coming up, uh, you know, a few years from now. Uh, but nobody thinks about UAE as a spacefaring nation. They, they actually are very, they're very aggressive at wanting to be a part of the Mars exploration strategy. And, and they have the assets and the brain power uh, to do that. So I, I think you're going to find that every nation that has the capability of becoming a spacefaring nation will be a part of that team. Another focus of your administration has been the privatization of space, especially being here at the Spacecom Expo. What does that mean for the general public? Um, in my estimation, it means, while it, it will, you know, not in, the, not in the foreseeable future do I think we're going to get to the point where people will go to the local spaceport uh, buy a ticket like they do to go from, from uh, Houston back to Washington, D.C. But once NASA migrates away from where we are today in the Earth-reliant environment of, of Earth orbit, and we move out to the next stage, which we call uh, the proving ground, where we're in cislunar space, what's going to happen is the void of operating and running low Earth orbit will be filled by commercial space, the people that are at this conference today. 
So that in itself will open opportunities for uh, people who never would have, they would have dreamed of going to space, but they just wouldn't have had a way to do it. But there will be a necessity for them to do it. I, I mentioned to the folk in, in this audience this morning that uh, while none of them have probably thought about it, everybody now needs to start thinking about what's the, what is the next group of astronauts going to be like that's going to operate uh, the low Earth orbit environment that will replace the International Space Station, because it has a finite lifetime. And as we replace it with multiple laboratories and facilities and the like, uh, NASA's not going to have astronauts to leave behind. NASA's going to take its astronauts and migrate out to cislunar space to operate in the vicinity of the moon and then on to Mars. Somebody's got to stay behind to mind the store, you know, to take vehicles as they come to low Earth orbit uh, for staging to go on to the moon and then on to Mars. And that somebody will be commercial and entrepreneurial entities, maybe even universities. You know, universities run what we here in the United States, we call federally funded research and development centers, FFRDCs. Uh, my guess is there will be a few FFRDCs in low Earth orbit uh, replacing the International Space Station, perhaps within the next 10 years. Uh, they will be peopled or run by uh, university professors and, uh, and by students and the like. Uh, again, that's, that's what I think the future of space holds. Uh, another major focus of NASA at the moment is yes. the search for life. Yeah. How far off do you think we are a major discovery regarding oh, the alone oh, in the universe? How far off are we from discovering life elsewhere in the universe? We're oh so close. Uh, a tremendous discovery was, was that of uh, the flowing water, ice, though it, though it may be, very briny water on the surface of Mars. Um, there are people who study what we call extremophiles, uh, life forms, and we're talking about microbial life. We're not talking about people walking around. So I need to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about when we talk about life. Um, we're talking about the very foundation of life itself, microbial life, single cell things. Um, people who study those in, who go down into the craters of active volcanoes and find life forms just above the lava, or people who go down to, the, to Antarctica and go under the ice shelf and find actually living microbes that are living in this ice. That's exactly what has caused them to be incredibly excited about flowing water, as briny as it may be, on the surface of Mars, because they think, wow, that could be just like uh, the ice flows and the glaciers in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. And if we found life there, we've got to be able to find life uh, on Mars. There are people who believe that we'll find life in the ocean of Europa, uh, a moon of Jupiter, or in the ocean of Enceladus, a big moon of Saturn, both of which now have the geysers, uh, geyser-like activity where water goes hundreds of meters into the air. Uh, we actually flew Cassini. Uh, we took it down to 30 feet, 30, 30 miles above the surface of, uh, of Enceladus recently. And hopefully, when the data comes back, we may find that, who, who knows, there may be some signs of microscopic life uh, actually in the water that's coming up from the ocean of uh, Enceladus. What does the upcoming American presidential election mean for your administration? What it means for me as the NASA administrator and, and the agency as a whole is it means that we have a big challenge come August of 2016, and that challenge will be to get out and interact with the two transition teams to make sure that we give them the best possible information about their space agency, about the space agency that they're going to be responsible for, so that uh, if at all possible, we're able to continue the programs on which we're embarked right now uh, to make sure that we don't get farther away from Mars with humans than we are right now. We're closer than we've ever been before. And to take a turn right now could start us in the other direction. Uh, I think that would, that's our big focus, is to, to go out and, and work with both parties, or three parties, or however many parties there are, uh, to make sure that the potential leadership of the country uh, fully understands what potential they have in this great agency that we call the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.